Hey, I am Tony Capecini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Parsons TKO. We are the engagement uh, architecture consulting firm helping mission-driven organizations with their processes, plans, technologies, and governance, and moving everything forward to really focus on affinity building with audiences and all the pieces in between there. Uh, but I'm really excited for today's conversation. You know, uh, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, have we reached the peak CMS? Um, and CMS is very uh, much, it's aligned with websites. We think about every, when you hear CMS, you often think about websites. You know, websites are still important and they are big investments and, and they tend to be invested in, you know, but they're still not the one ring to rule them all. I think there is a, a potential that, you know, over investments in content management systems and websites can really lead to a lopsided portfolio and kind of hurt what you're trying to do a little sometimes in some of that engagement architecture for really building affinity with audiences and being able to segment over time. So I think some things we're going to dive into today, uh, you know, how do we know when an industry or a technology is reaching a plateau? How do we, how do we consider technology evolution uh, and the obsolescence of technology that we know will happen as part of our budgeting and planning and thinking about going forward, especially during digital transformation that's really occurring now, amplified by the current state of affairs we're living in under COVID, really pushing everything to that digital front. And then how much does technology even matter when at the end of the day, it's really all about the people in our organizations and the processes that we have to use to make these things work. Uh, so again, I'm really excited. Like I said, we are recording. Please ask questions in the chat and I'm gonna introduce uh, my guest panelists now. I have my good friend, Deanna Humphrey, if you'd like to say a word or two, Deanna. Hey everybody, uh, thanks, excited to be here. My name is Deanna Humphrey and I'm the Managing Director um, at Do Big Things, which is a digital marketing agency. Uh, so we work with a lot of clients on fundraising, advocacy, um, and overall like messaging. And Tony and I have known each other for a few years now uh, when he was a partner with me over at No Kid Hungry and helping me solve some of these uh, uh, same problems. So excited to, to be here with all of you to discuss discuss this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Diana. Uh, and our friend Felipe Jaramillo, who I, I'm going to let you say your last name. I've been practicing it for like three days now. <laughs> Felipe. Thank you, Tony. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Felipe Jaramillo. I'm the CEO of, and founder of Aplica. I've been working on the CMS space for over 15 years. Uh, I've been exposed to a, a small, medium, and very large sites. And uh, I think we're seeing uh, very interesting trends in the transformation of the CMS space or the evolution of, of, of CMS uh, to DXP and to um, to achieve um, a, a broader set, set of, of, of capabilities for for uh, for organizations. So it's very nice to, to be able to uh, to discuss some of these of these trends and some of our vision from both a technical and an organizational point of view. Awesome. Thank you, Felipe. Uh... And our last uh, discussion for today, my partner, Nate Parsons. Hello, everybody. It's nice to meet, meet you all. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to, to discuss this topic as well. I'm Tony and Felipe and other folks, and I've been having this conversation for, for many years now in various forms, and it's nice to kind of have a chance to talk about what we're seeing now, because I think um, just in the last two or three years, there's been a really interesting shift in the focus and where a lot of the research and R&D money seems to be going from the commercial CMS vendors. And, you know, I think there's that, you know, bodes for trends all across the board, even in the open source CMS world. So, uh, yeah, but I'm excited to, to talk with you all about this. Excellent. And I, I would be utterly remiss if I didn't thank Andrea Bishop uh, from Parsons TKO, who is our administrator and makes all of these events happen. Thank you, Andrea. It is most appreciated as always. Uh, so without further ado, Parsons TKO, we do have a saying, we like to say that answers get all the credit, but questions do all the work. So, you know, today is really one of those explorations and to see what questions we can ask and kind of what ideas as a group we might be able to pull away from this. The topic of this conversation started as an internal discussion that Nate really got into the other day, and it was pretty fascinating, which is, you know, have we reached peak, peak CMS? And you had started talking about when we think about cell phones or mobile phones, whatever the proper way to call them is these days. But you know, you, you're continually buying, but how much feature are you getting for every new expense and every time you buy a new phone? And it has CMS started to move in that direction as well? So Nate, I don't know if you wanna lead us off and then we'll start tossing it around to our other uh, panelists. 
Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think uh, you know we, we were talking. I was kind of like recounting my uh, my historic view of CMS. You know, when I first started doing uh, website development way back in like uh, you know two thousand, um, a lot of the content management systems did everything that you needed to do online. You know, they handled all of the content, all of the marketing, all of that functionality. But that was partly because it was a simpler time and people didn't really know what they're doing, and anything that could like lower the technical barrier to doing this activity was was welcomed. It, there were a lot of all-in-one CMSs that did all of your marketing. But then, you know, over the period of time, you know, those started to mature and people started to say, hey, instead of having a CMS that kind of does a few things well, I'm going to get a specific email program and a specific CRM program and a specific social media program and all these different things. And people started to get really deep specialized programs uh, or that kind of help different parts of their marketing and, and handle different channels. And you know, just over the last couple of years, I've started to see the, the pendulum shift back. And partly the reason for that is that CMSs have kind of reached a place where they do all the things that they need to do to manage the web channel. And, you know, there's different, you know, kind of mixes of, of strengths and weaknesses in the interface or the object models of these different content management systems, but they all are sort of converging on the same place in terms of what they do and what value they provide. And what we've seen is that the, the vendors who are realizing this are starting to add and pull back in things to their platform Partly because one of the things that's still hard is not necessarily reaching someone the first time, but engaging with them multiple times and having a, a deeper and you know more meaningful relationship with your audiences. And so what we've seen is that a lot of CMSs are starting to rebrand themselves as digital experience platforms. And what that DXP moniker really means is that they're trying to pull in some of the CRM functionality and some of the marketing automation functionality and some of the like contact management functionality, basically that other systems used to manage and try and connect that with the web content to make it a lot easier for someone who comes to your website to be part of a larger and more repeat conversation. And, you know, I think that trend is, is uh, you know, sort of a good example of why they don't think there are features directly in the content management world that are valuable or differentiating enough anymore. And so that made me sort of think, well, maybe we've kind of hit the, the peak of this technology or this need for, you know, the foreseeable future. So. That's kind of what led to this this discussion a little bit, I think. Felipe, you've been building content management systems for a long time, you know, and Nate brings up DXP. What are, what are you seeing in that space? Is there an evolution to experience platform and, and how fundamentally different is it than a content management system? Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing a, a trend of, of, um, of, system, of, of the higher end CMS systems rebrand themselves as digital experience platforms. And I think this, this shifts the focus from content into a broader experience, uh, primarily for the customer, but also there are other implicit experiences when you're bringing up products, right? Like there is the organizational experience, the development experience, the operational experience, but essentially they are they're trying to broaden the uh, the type of, of, of customer experience that are supported. You see very interesting trends this year. So uh, the analysts think that we've reached somehow reach uh, peak CMS. Uh, the Garden Magic Quadrant uh, stop uh, has stopped being uh, issued for web content management. They think that WCM is a mature uh, that products are too uh, homogenous. Um, that we've reached maturity of these project pro products, and uh, Forrester actually calls them that we've 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 completed the classic era of of, of CMS, right? Uh, so there's the CMS space still needs uh, some work, and if you start if you are very involved in the technical or editorial part, you know you still feel that there are quite a few things to do. But I think the focus is shifting towards towards integration with other technologies. Uh, towards a personalization is a key trend that you see uh, that you see um, uh, sorry it's a key term that you see uh, mentioned uh, quite a bit um, and you also have the multiple channel uh, uh, challenges that need to be that need to be um, fulfilled so I think that um, that some systems are better suited to the DXP space some other systems are not aspiring to become a DXP uh, and, and a key uh, finding you see is that there was no clear winner of the of the CMS war right there, there, there no, no no system came out on top and it's actually uh, a reflection of different organizations needing different systems to do different things and uh, and we're gonna see those that transition take place as the higher end uh, uh, systems are rebranded as DXPs uh, whereas some other uh, lower tiered systems just are happy to be CMS systems for the for the for the broad public. If if personalization is the desired gold standard, does does being in something like a DXP make that an easier 
pathway to get this to personalization compared to the CMS that's weaved in with, you know, the marketing automation system, with the analytic system, with well, I, I think there is a promise of integration, right? And uh, I, I think it's also uh, it's, it's also driven because of the fact that it's very hard to integrate uh, disparate systems. So the promise integration says, okay, you you'll use this CMS system and you'll use some sort of personalization engine that is built in the system and you'll use some e-commerce capabilities uh, that are that are built into the system. I think that personalization. Um, is a big promise, but when you start looking at the details of implementation and what people want to be um, to, to, to be exposed of and, and how much personal information you are actually is actually being used to drive this experience can have a mixed uh, set of, uh, of, 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 uh, of feelings from, from, from the end user. So I think that personalization is still something that we're saying as being done either more explicit or in certain cases more implicit just based on your um, on your browsing patterns or, or other content that you that you're that you're consuming. Diana, hmm. all right, take it over to you. Uh, you know, I know from working with you and in your experiences tying needing to tie things like fundraising in to that experience, which the website for all intents and purposes might be a, a way to get people onto a list, but it becomes that segmentation and then trying to get the personalization. And if all budgets always gone to web, you know, what's left for email and and how do you feel about having monolithic systems back to separated systems back to an all-in-one. Yeah. It's like five questions in one for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, uh, I, mean, I apologize now because my cat is very passionate about this as well. So you'll probably hear him screaming in the background. So um, just don't, don't mind him here. Um, you know, I think that the, um, it is, it's the question I think a lot of organizations are asking themselves, like, do you have this sort of one system to rule them all, or do you have these sort of separate systems? And the challenge is, um, to Felipe's point, is that no matter how much they say they integrate, right, most systems do not talk to each other in, in, in time that won't lose some data somewhere, won't like, you know, have a manual process in, in the system at some point, um, or just be really clunky because they're proprietary and they want you to use their one system to rule them all. Um, and, you know, I think when you're thinking about the creating an experience for your users, um, it is important that the narrative that you're talking about on digital is reflected everywhere and that you have a real understanding of where and how people entered into that narrative so that you can create an experience that speaks to that narrative. So, you know, when you invest a lot in your website, but you don't have a, an email team or a digital team th that's balancing out those other pieces, you're losing some part, or if you're not working in coordination with your fundraising team and your programming team, you know, you're losing out on um, some of that personalized experience. And, you know, the thing is, is that um, audiences have become so sophisticated uh, these days that to just assume that just because they got to your content somehow that whatever you say is just that that's they're going to have and whatever experience that you think that you want them to have is enough is no longer enough i mean for some people it is right but i think that um you know having uh, clear data points of where folks came in and trying to speak to that experience is going to change how people engage with you because ultimately you know you want the people that come to your um, to your organization to be ambassadors for your message, and the best way to do that is to create create a personal connection with them, and that's by doing that is like looking at the data, seeing where people came in, and seeing okay, well, I've got a pool of people here that came in through the website, um, and they came in through the website let's say through an Omaze campaign or something like that, right? For those of you who have engaged in Omaze campaigns, you've probably seen a drop off after people have tried to win this car with Daniel Craig or whatever I tried, I didn't win. But they really just wanted to win that car and hang out with Daniel Craig. But let's figure out how we convert them into somebody who actually cares about your organization. And so, you know, you're going to use the data and you're going to use, you know, talk to the, um, you know, where they came in and, you know, create that personalization experience because then they're going to say, oh, actually, they 
really care about me, even though that's your systems at work right behind that's creating an experience that makes them feel like they're really truly valued. And then they're going to turn around and be ambassadors for that message. So, you know, I, I think while, you know, some organizations are not going to get to this place where it's the Excalibur of all the things, um, it is important that like, you know, there is a balance between, you know, a fancy, pretty website um, and the all of the other pieces that are integrated because it's the same thing, right, with a very sophisticated email program. And then you send them to a website that is like six clicks before they get to what they are looking for folks are going to have that same experience so i'm curious and then i'll start i'll get back over to you i promise nate uh but diana we have talked about integration so far now in this conversation but it's, it's been from a very technical perspective and you started talking about the different departments that all have to start playing together i mean how much integration of systems matters and how much does it really matter that the organization starts to integrate how the different departments work together, including the budgets between the departments? I don't know if you have thoughts on this. I know you've had some inside experiences. I have as well, but I'd like to hear from you if you have some thoughts I, on that. You know, I have thoughts on this, having worked with me as, um, you know, uh, trying to make uh, not just the systems talk together, but uh, the teams talk together, right? Because, you know, I, I think that it is a very old school, but it's still very much alive notion that when you're talking to your donors, this is donors only, and this is the fundraising department's responsibility. And then when you're talking other things, it's the comms responsibility and you might be talking programs and it's really the program's responsibility, but those things work in accord with each other. You know, if if we if the fundraising team doesn't know what the the program team is working on, how can they really truly talk about how our work is making a difference? If the digital team is not in, integrated with the um, fundraising team, how can we truly make sure that no matter where the the budget is, right? Because every organization is different. Some organizations, digital is raising the money, but the budget line is in fundraising. Some, you know, it may it may be a combination of both. So. You know, I, I really think it is critical that folks, you know, I, I had a client recently that was like, how, how can we do this work? And I said, well, what? at a minimum, you should be starting with like having an integrated team that is talking through those things. You should be planning together to ensure that even though, you know, listen, there's going to be goals that each team has, which is, is also critically important because the goal shouldn't be like support the fundraising team, right? Because that's not where the work ends for digital or for programs. Um, but it is so important. Um, to have folks talking to each other and aligning on goals because um, I think that um, you're losing out on something uh, when uh, the de departments that are doing a, a, a heavy lift for the organization um, are not truly integrated and not um, talking to each other and not ensuring that the sort of the cyclical, you know, when I worked at Greenpeace, uh, when we unleashed campaigns on KFC or whomever, you know, we had the digital, we had the media, we had the, um, you know, uh, grassroots team, all of us integrated to make sure that that campaign experience, no matter where people saw that, um, that campaign un unravel, it was, you know, all the message was the same thing. And that when you drilled down into thinking about digital, it's it's no different. So I think that is a, a really critical point that I think that a lot of organizations even now are still struggling with. So thank you. So, uh, you know, as you were talking, it was making me think maybe it, I, if, if we really went upstream, maybe the integration really has to start with when we get the budgets and that starts getting put together is stop looking at it as the comms budget, the fundraising budget, the IT budget, the, this budget, and how do we actually make those all sort of tie into that portfolio picture. Uh, but Nate, this is something we talk about a lot and 2020 has been a hell of a year uh, <laughs> to say the least. How do we, how should we think about, you know, digital transformation is here. What do we think about this planning going forward? What kind of budgets should we be thinking about and what things could we be asking for or looking out to, towards in the future? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, I, you know uh, everything Deanna said really read, it resonates with me because I think one of the things that I, th I think is also true is that fundraising departments often have the skill sets to use these digital experience platforms more uh, deeply than the communications teams, but the communications teams are usually involved in the procurement of these kind of solutions. And so I do think there's a need for Kind of joint budgeting and thinking through those pieces you know it's, it's not uncommon in some in, in nonprofits for the fundraising team to have separate messaging separate communication separate contact lists from the communications team you know even though there's a 
a clear parallel, right? Like if you think about it from a sales perspective, the communications team is sort of the lead generation arm where they're meeting people, they're building their reputation on the brand and they're finding people who might wanna become deeper uh, supporters, either financially, reputationally or activity wise. And you know, that handoff is really awkward in a lot of organizations because it's kind of like you go from one messaging and one marketing uh, kind of campaign to a totally different one run by different people with different sensibilities and sometimes even different language about the organization or different imagery around their organization. And, you know, this technology shift has the possibility and the opportunity to solve a lot of those problems. And so that's the promise of it. I think that's the advantage of it, but it requires both cooperation in terms of using the platform, configuring the platform, jointly deciding the platform, but maybe more importantly on the business process and the campaign work and the thinking about how contacts are, are organized and the value of an anonymous person and how you turn that anonymous person into a valued supporter, you know, and I think that this concept of like prospecting within your uh, audience base is pretty novel in the communication side, but it's very well understood in the fundraising side. And there's a huge opportunity there for them to sort of cross train each other and to learn from each other, you know, and I think that's why this is hard and why a lot of organizations struggle with digital experience in, in all its formats, even if they don't have a all in one platform or they even have great integrated platforms. It's because the people process behind it is the digital transformation piece that is the hard piece. Like you can go buy a HubSpot CMS today and it'll be awesome and integrated with all of that data, but that won't make it your experience awesome. You know, what'll make your experience awesome is, you know, developing a, a wonderful and cohesive, you know, outreach campaign that moves people from, I heard about you from something, I came to your website, I was really interested in it. I took a deeper action, like I attended a webinar, or I signed up your email list or whatnot. And then as I got to know you better, other opportunities were presented to me that stair-stepped me into a deeper engagement with the organization. And, you know, that's the, the success mindset, I think, that will help drive organizational success both in the private and the nonprofit communities. Excellent. Felipe, question for you. So as a, a leader in the, you know, CMS application development space and, and all the work you've been doing, when you come in and take these projects on, what are the conversations like with the folks you're having and hearing Deanna and Nate talk a lot of about here really is CRM and email marketing. How does that play into to your thinking when you come in to build those bigger applications? Oh, you're muted too, Felipe. So I think that um, the organizations have the challenge of deciding if they need to uh, re-platform their, 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 their CMS, if they need to go, um, to a different system in order to achieve the kind of vision that that is being being brought in by you know fundraising or call or the comp same. So I think that we're changing from a mature industry for CMS into more a promise of an integrated digital experience. And I think that we are in the early days of DXP and we are in the classic or mature days of CMS. And I think that what makes it hard is that the switching cost of CMS is quite high, right? Uh, and it's tightly integrated with the experience that you design today. So, um, so considering the life cycle of the CMS platforms is, is, is definitely a challenge um, as you need to involve IT and you need to involve uh, the different, the different uh, organizational units to make the decisions, understanding that it's going to be very hard to switch and that you're gonna have a lot of uh, investment into a CMS centric platform um, and as you start integrating business heavy operations into, into that new experience, it's going to be harder to, to, uh, to migrate to a different platform. And also to understand that some of these CMS systems are not built for this DXP vision. They may now be branded, but there's going to be a lot of rebuilding, internal rebuilding of the systems that are going to require you to be either up to date uh, with, their, with their newer versions or do some sort of, of, of redevelopment as you, as you move along. So in this transition uh, phase, there, that, that's definitely a, a key consideration for the future as it's probably not as easy as moving from, from other um, other pieces of, of, of the experience uh, moving forward. Yeah, as you're talking there, it just makes me think that, uh, yeah, I've been doing technology implementation for a really long time too, 20 plus years, and you'd always get to the end, you'd implement it and it'd be out there and then you'd have to talk about that maintenance budget and everyone's like, what, I gotta pay something? And you're like, yeah, it's not done, uh, but it's it's never done, right? Digital transformation isn't, isn't like, there's no destination there, it's, you're gonna keep going. We say that about data as well. I think I've seen some questions come in on the, 
Um, over here, let's see. I'm curious about what the panelists think are actionable KPIs that can be shared across teams in order to create more shared goals and experiences for audiences. Thank you, Emily. That's a great question. Does anyone want to start with that one? I am. Um... I, that's a great question. And, you know, when I think about goals, uh, creating goals for my team, um, I'm often asking them to look at like organizational goals that trickle down. And so their goals should be feeding up. And, you know, when thinking about uh, how do you ensure that you've got some KPIs that speak to all, of, you know, your your top programs, fundraising, digital and, and programs, like I think that you have, if folks are planning together, um, and that you can come up with those goals. Cause I, you know, I, I think a lot about um, the disconnect, no matter how much we plan together, that, that's one thing in every organization that I've worked with that has attempted to integrate has been missing from, from goal setting is to creating those uh, goals that feed into one another. And I think that um, that is truly the thing that's missing because then those, that top line North Star feeds down to your departments and then feeds down to, uh, yeah, my cat, so he's got a lot to say about this, uh, feeds down from your department, then feeds down to individuals. And then that, you know, as they're creating their goals that feeds up to, um, you know, those sort of master goals. So, you know, I think that having an integrated fundraising goal and that is not just the online, right? Because when you think about um, uh, fundraising departments obviously have offline goals, but we need to make sure that from the digital team that that is reflected somewhere in, in our digital communications, that there is an, the ability to give offline um, and not just talk about online. When we're talking about our program goals, like programs need to be sure that they are talking about, um, you know, what digital assets they have to be able to engage in using those um, platforms to um you know, to communicate their um, program goals on a regular basis. So, you know, I think that as part of a goal setting process, if you are having, you know, an integrated fundraising goal, an integrated program goal, an integrated digital goal that all feed into the sort of circular that then will feed down to your departmental goals and then your um, team goals. I think that, that that's a great place to, to start. Nate, Felipe, you wanna talk about KPIs? I'll just throw one on real quick, which is that um, I, I, I think that KPIs that create a little bit of positive tension between departments are really valuable. Like I think if, if the communications team needs to deliver certain amounts of prospects to the, to the development team, that kind of thing can be really positive because it's really easy for the, those departments to never speak. So, you know, I think, um, you know, just building on what Deanna said, I think if they can, if the chicken trickle up together, that's much better than if one department does X and another department does Y, right? Because they really need, you're trying to foster bridges, both technology, communications, and process between those activities. And so that's just one little area that I think, you know, KPIs in particular are very valuable if one department has to service another department directly in their KPI. I, I mean, at this time, I wouldn't have a set of KPIs that are applicable to different uh, organizations. But I, but I definitely would say is that you know you need to have a, a data a, a data a data practice in your team so that you can clearly define what those KPIs are going to be. Uh, when we talk about experience, and we if we look at just plain uh, visits or pages, we are it, it's very hard to infer the how satisfied they are with that experience, right? And if it, and what they are actually needing. So uh, I've seen you know, great benefits and uh, in having usability practice where somebody is actually looking at the actual uh, usage patterns of, of, of a wide array of, of users um, and also having a deeper analytics approach with uh, with, a, with a data centric team so that you can actually extract the, the data that is going to be more meaningful. As you start, as you start working across systems, you may have systems that talk together, but they are not reporting together. So, so having a match between a lot of these uh, static metrics uh, is going to be very important to, to actually have a, a, a broad view of, of, of what is actually being achieved. I like to think about that too, in the terms of how they're being reported and reported up and you know, who's gonna see them. Cause you can make these great KPIs across that department level, but if it never gets back to the executive team and the executive team actually doesn't care, then what was the point? So how do we really think about what the executive team's looking at from that top level to get those, those KPIs back? And then 
I think there's, because there's another question coming up here too, but you know, there is consumer conversion experience, which is let me get a lot of donors to the website to do small dollar donation. There's influence building experience, which is very different, right? I want to build the cloud of this organization. I want to be really well known and I want the, the blue chip media markets and I want to get big fundraising dollars. And I don't, I don't care as much about the $10 donation through the site. Those are very different experiences and values being placed in different uh, areas. So I think that's something to think about too. And then what are those reporting mechanisms um, to go out? That was, thank you for that, Emily. Uh, so Elaine has asked, uh, do you have different advice for a large multi-siloed bureaucratic organization? I've spent a lot of time in those, I have lots of thoughts on that, uh, versus a much smaller, less siloed one. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Everybody's smiling. Nate and Deanna are smiling a lot. Deanna, do you want to go? Nate, you want to go? I'll just dive in. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, there's definitely different advice. You know, I think that one of the things that's really a challenge uh, for for both organizations, but is, is a bigger problem in smaller organizations, I think, is to pick tools that are best in class versus ones that are really well suited and fit for the team size you have and the capacity and effort people can put into those tools. And so it's very easy to overbuy or overbuild your outreach platform in a smaller organization simply by picking a tool that has way too much functionality in it, you know, and I think that's um, counterintuitive, but most of the time you want to be trying to aim for like 75 or 80% of the feature set a tool offers that your organization is using. And, you know, if you're not reasonably going to be able to achieve that in the next two years, you shouldn't probably get that tool, you know, unless there's a big growth plan or, you know, some other reason that you think you're going to suddenly catapult up into a much larger team. You know, so I think that that also implies that, you know, you want to make that decision more collaborative between those groups, you know, and you want to make sure that the time to learn the tool is low and quick for the people who are going to be engaged in it, because you're not going to be able to support like onboarding and training and creating materials and updating all the training materials and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that's sort of the big difference for, I think, between large bureaucratic organizations and smaller, more agile ones is that in larger bureaucratic organizations, you have the ability to build materials to kind of support people's onboarding and to build processes that kind of can help ensure data quality and do those sorts of things. And so you can use tools that have bigger feature sets or more flexibility in how you can implement something. There might be seven ways to do something instead of one way to do something because the process and the onboarding and bureaucracy can help manage those sorts of things. So that's kind of the positive, right? I think the the, the negative in the large multi-siloed bureaucratic organizations is that they tend to procure these systems more than once. Like uh, it's not uncommon for us to find not one CRM, but five CRMs, each managed by a different program or different department. And they certainly often have their own websites and microsites. And, you know, it's not uncommon for them different email systems. And so the challenge in the big bureaucratic systems is to do what I call data contracting, which is to say for the, at the organizational level, like at a CTO or chief operations officer level, somebody needs to start saying, we are going to share the following data and that's an organizational mandate. And you, we're going to let you have the freedom within the different fiefdoms inside the organization to procure whatever you want, but you have to adhere to this data contract, which will let certain amounts of data be shared in certain regulated ways across the organization. And, you know, if those data contracts aren't in place, you're going to have real problems, you know, making all of these things work and having a cohesive experience. But the flip side of that, and, you know, the reason that it's not always such an Achilles heel is that Sometimes those different parts of the organization are speaking to completely different audiences with completely different experiences. And so that's just one thing you have to weigh is that the bigger and more complex an organization, the more use cases that are actually being serviced. And each of those use cases may or may not be a great fit to be in one solution or even be in one data contract. You know, you may not want to have like your, you know, supporting five through eight year olds be in the same, you know, email CRM campaign possibilities as something that's supporting, you know, uh, you know, military colonels who are serving overseas, right? Like, you know, and some organizations have literally those two groups as part of their program portfolio, you know? And so that's just something to think through a little bit, which is that in big organizations, you can lean on the bureaucracy positively, but you also have the possibility of dealing with a much more heterogeneous environment. So yeah. that's my thought. Yeah, yeah. To, just to add to that, um, because I think that the a lot of the challenges for large organizations, um, in part is like people just going out and because they're operating independently, acquiring, getting CRMs to do just the one thing that they need to do. But the thing is, is that, um, you know, there may be those special groups that that CRM is speaking to, but what happens when one person is on all five of those CRMs and you're not 
talking to each other, right? So you're creating an experience for that person without even knowing that you might be messaging about one campaign, five different ways or whatever it is, right? And so I think that um, it, it is important to, and this is very difficult for nonprofits in particular to stop and pause and like really assess what what systems and and what lists people are talking to, um, and you know it is not something that people want to do because the work often doesn't stop right. And so, especially for organizations that are often responsive to what's going on, um, but it is it, it's important to take a pause and do an assessment. And, and you know, one of the I I talked a lot about like integration with programs and funders and comms, but IT is critical to that because they are all they have um, you know are often holding the keys to some of these systems, um, and they have the knowledge to understand. The, let's at, let's ask the problem that we're trying to solve, which I think oftentimes people don't either when they're bringing on new CRMs. They're not asking themselves what's the problem I'm trying to solve. They say oh, I need a list, and so and so isn't responsive. So let me just go ahead build my own microsite or let me just go ahead and get the CRM and add another MailChimp account when I, I don't even ask me about MailChimp but like you know when someone else might be using a different MailChimp account and so you know, it is important to ensure that you at least have, um, you know, a liaison or something um, with these departments so that you're constantly having these conversations and planning conversations. And, you know, often what happens, right, when groups decide that they want to invest in digital, if that's even the question that they're asking, which is an important question that groups should be asking, but if they decide, then, you know, there might be an explosion here of people on the digital side and maybe the fundraising is still tiny or there is a huge explosion on, you know, when I worked at Sierra Club, it, you know, one of the biggest priorities that we had was coal, right? Well, so then the Beyond Coal campaign shot up, you know, tenfold to, to everything else and, and how are we supporting that? And so, um, you know, it is important to also like ask yourselves as you're building your organization, as you're building your budgets, um, how are you supporting these things so that you're not just piecemealing all of these things together and then asking yourself what happened to my list is the, you know, I'm seeing, you know, less um, engagement, uh, less, you know, um, you know, a, a, a different experience for people online. I, you know, um, I am, I gave some money to some can candidates, uh, in this last election. And now I'm in the mega hold of the democratic list hydra of things. And I don't even know anymore. I can't even unsubscribe because every time I cut one off four more pop up, love our democracy it's great it's going to be great however i don't think anybody's asking what my experience is uh as a user who just literally got four emails about georgia in the past hour uh and i will get more about georgia in the past hour and i don't know where they're coming from and but you can bet believe that some somebody it, these folks are talking to each other but they're not really truly talking to each other in terms of how that experience trickles down to the user um and so i think that that's really important to sort of take a pause and sort of ask yourself um you know are we doing this right and you know are we doing digital because it's really truly a strategy here are we thinking more of it on a very surface level because that's another question i think that um you know people have to ask themselves for smaller organizations it, it it can be a little bit easier because you probably have deeper relationships and you may be wearing multiple hats um but that it's still um you know i think the the tendency to silo is still there and so that's something to you know just make sure that um folks are addressing as they're building their programs it's interesting yeah i just made me think it, it's it's so often that will sacrifice the depth of long-term affinity, which we know is heavy return value for what we need to do in the immediate and short-term, thinking that the the, cri the priority of the moment is the, the crisis when it's really that long-term goal you got to get to. Felipe, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on that one too, the bureaucratic versus yeah, the What small. I feel is interesting is that some of these multi-siloed bureaucratic organizations it, it, it force you to deal with different sized uh, silos. So sometimes you have like the 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 the, the main uh, nonprofit uh, which has some programs, and essentially the technical decisions that are driving uh, some of these transformations are done first in, in different stages or steps. So sometimes you start with the with with a big you know mothership side, and then you start uh, having needs for the smaller uh, projects, and uh, you have. Two main choices, right? You you can you can have an integrated approach with some very strict governance, and you find a system or a platform that will allow you to have 
multiple sites uh, sharing content, managers working together, or you have an approach where you leave some of these technical decisions uh, for platform uh, to the to the actual program owners uh, in, in in the organization. And uh, I think that you know the promise of having an integrated system that will work across different uh, independent sites and independent uh, touch points uh, is 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 still quite critical. Um, but it also has the issues of governance and convincing some of these uh, independent approaches that were usually uh, previously operating independently with their own uh, agencies or their own sites uh, in, into joining uh, with a promise of, hey, now we're going to build this great DXP system and you show them the brochures and you show them, you know, the, the sales material that, you, that, that, you, that you've gathered and probably the, 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 their way of operating and their, their pain points are quite different from what, you know, the, the bigger organization has. Yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, and then Elaine, thank you for that so much. The smaller organization, I would say the, the thing there is every purchase really matters. Every time a dollar goes out the door and that there is a higher expectation of the return on investment and a, and a speed at which, because it's digital, people think it needs to be instant. You know, and marketing is at best a six month game once it gets started, if you can run it consistently to UC returns. Where these larger bureaucratic organizations, they have budgets they have to spend within a year, right? They'll get towards the end of the year and it's, oh my God, I got $100,000 left in this budget. It has to go out the door. So the, the impact they feel in a, in a technology choice being, at, it's not as critical as it could be in that smaller organization. So I'd say, Make sure in the smaller organization, you know, make sure you're really getting buy-in from the leadership. They understand what it is you're trying to achieve, the time and patience it's going to take to have that achievement hit, because it won't be as instant as they think. But to reassure that you really have a strong plan and how it's going to get implemented, to see it forward. And I think you know what Nate was saying, what we like to say at Parsons TKO is you got to find the right fit solution, not the best in class. Like what's the thing that's going to work for you now to get to that six months to the year? Cause you can evolve out of it. Once things are there, you can always get to a bigger system, but that's a little bit what we see in those larger bureaucratic organizations. It's just the, the amount of money they have to spend and literally have to spend, or they don't get it back the next year. Um, so thank you for that. So we have a question from uh, John Wheeler. He says, I'd like to know how you can evaluate ROI for additional costs of a going of going to a more customized web experience. Who wants to dive into that one first? Well, I don't know. I have some thoughts on that because I've actually been thinking about that recently. Which is that um, you know I think uh, this is another place where the development teams inside nonprofits, especially, have a lot of experience, right? Like there's a, an average amount of money that's given to you by a first time visitor, anonymous web visitor. And there's an amount of money that's given to you by a high you know, net worth donor who you built a relationship with who is really supportive of your organization's mission, right? And there's a, usually a, a pretty big gulf between those two. And you know, as we you know, personalize the experience, what we're really doing is moving people from the very far left side stage where they're anonymous and they may give you a small donation closer to the large, deeper relationship side where they're likely to give you a larger donation. And, you know, if you're personalizing uh, your outreach well, what you're really doing is creating an additional stage of higher value, potential higher value uh, users. And they, that value might be in reputation or might be financial or might be in reach. You know, there's different ways that are, they help the organization. And I think each of those should be sort of measured. You know, some of the people you build a personalized experience for are going to build their personal brand with your content and with your organization more online. And that'll increase your reach and your reputation if you're doing a good job with that. You know, other folks will feel a higher affinity to you and might have a longer lifetime value. Instead of giving you $5 once, maybe they'll give you, you know, $5 a month for five years, you know, and so there's a lifetime value there. And then, you know, for others, it might be that they are in a position to wield influence that helps your organization. Maybe they staff a congressperson. Maybe they make decisions within an organization that you want changed or influenced, you know, and I think each of those folks, you get to know better and you have more ability to access their potential with the personalized experience. And, you know, the first thing to do is to sort of help build that mathematical financial model that kind of says, we think the, uh, an anonymous web visitor is worth potentially this much. And it might be on the order of pennies when you average it out across the number of visitors to come to your site and the amount of money they generate versus the high net worth donor. And then starting to stratify those things in between those, you know, or the you know foundational giver, whatever your, your largest beneficiary sort of is at the top end. 
And that model is really helpful because what you really want organizations to see is that by personalizing the experience, we are creating a more valuable cohort of our audience, however it may be valued. I think yeah. there's, there's, there, that's quite a challenge compared to other areas of personalization. So if you look at e-commerce, the personalization case is already settled, right? If it's quite proven that, you know, conversions increase as you provide a more personal experience and you get, you know, product recommendations. And usually I see, uh, you know, personalization platforms using these cases uh, as, apl as applicable to, to, to different, um, to different types of industries. I think in the in the nonprofit space, it's much harder to justify an ROI. And more than coming up with an ROI model is, is actually make you know being able to uh, to explain it and, and making sure it's it's meaningful and it's measurable as you move along in implementation, it doesn't change uh, as 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 you start seeing you know real usage experience of personalization. I think the promise of you know people are gonna get personalized content and you're gonna you know, have a few blog posts uh, suggested for somebody uh, based on their previous uh, usage patterns is going to relate to uh, you know, deeper engagement and, uh, and more affinity with, your, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the nonprofit. I think it's hard. I feel it's, it's, it's that way, but uh, definitely setting a, our, an ROI model is going to be a challenge. I think just yeah. one thing to just add there, um, you know, I think that, and this is very elementary and, and probably everyone on this call knows this, but like getting the reports from the web team to see what, um, how folks are experiencing and investing in things like Hotjar so that you can see where people, what people are doing and when, right? Because then you can say, okay, well, um, we see that people have come in, we've got a ton of people that are coming in through ads and they're doing the following X, Y, and Z before they're dropping off. So then you can say, okay, well, we've seen this over time, this trend over time of this is what happens when people come in through ads, this is what, pe what happens when people come in through social. Then that says, okay, well, here's the place that you can make some investment, but that's, you've done that after doing getting some data points from um, different softwares that you've integrated into your to your web to say okay well now's the time that we can show that uh, this is the experience that people are having and this is where we need to customize to create a more um, personalized experience yeah i think in terms of roi there too just my two cents in the private sector i mean they're just using data so much more effectively and efficiently than we do in the mission-driven space and we have to start embracing it more. I mean, what's the lifetime value of a contact that's been in your CRM? Can you even tell how many times did you change the CRM? And where, where has that contact been? How long has the contact been there? I think we often, again, just we sacrifice for the immediacy over the long term. What's, what's the five year gain or the 10 year? If I had a relationship with my nonprofit, you know, I've worked at some organizations celebrating 65, 75, 100 year anniversaries all the contacts are still less than five years old. That's crazy. So how do we start to think about that? I think as well in that personalization and the return on investment is how do we get better at tracking those contacts over their longevity with us? And even not just maybe that dollar they give today, but how many other people they could bring back? Because if I really became a fan, am I going to spread your word for you? And now I bring three people back. So I'm, I'm my $10 multiplied by their $10. Just something I think about there. Thanks for that, John. That was great. Hopefully, uh, Hope we answered that for y'all. So we're about 10 minutes till close. I don't think we've answered the question though. Have we reached peak CMS? <laughs> we've talked a lot about all the technologies that go around it. The, should we be going back to the all-in-one DXP with a DXP style platform? It, it definitely sounds like it's got the, I like how you phrased it Felipe, it's the promise of all that integration and making it a lot easier technically speaking, but we still seems like we have the people part uh, to solve in that integration component and how do we make common goals. But for, for closing thoughts on, are we at peak CMS? Um, I might start with you, Nate, since you, you really spawned this, this topic in my, my brain and I thought it would be fun to talk about with everybody here today. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about some of the things that the CMS needs to do and how I think those are kind of plateauing. So, you know, Content management systems sort of started because people didn't really want to learn all of the HTML and CSS and JavaScript needed to kind of run their website, right? And so it kind of started out from less of a content management perspective and more of a layout management perspective, right? It wanted to, the content you had to look nice and be functional and work well. 
And, you know, content management systems, because of that, have always kind of been split between ones that model your content and manage your content really well in the back end and make it easy to find stuff and filter stuff and organize your content, and ones that have more kind of bespoke uh, layout and editing experiences for the front end that make things look nice, you know. And one of the reasons that I think content management systems are reaching this maturity point is that we're seeing more and more content management systems focus on managing the content and giving up on managing the layout. And so there are a lot of, there's a lot of energy right now in this area of the web called design systems, you know, which are really a way of managing the front end, the layout of the website more consistently and more developer friendly in a lot of ways, not even necessarily more uh, editor friendly. Um, and there's a lot of focus on speed. You know, Google's putting pressure on everybody to make their website as fast and as responsive as possible so that you appear high in their page ranks and so that you get that organic traffic that they can generate. And, you know, because of that, there's all this energy and how can you make websites as fast as possible? And a lot of those are doing this thing called static page generation, where instead of building the web page when somebody requests it, you build the web page ahead of time and you put it out there and then you maybe refresh it every five minutes or hour, or four hours or 24 hours, whatever it is, and you push a new copy out and people always get that pre-built web page, which makes it a lot faster to give it to that person, you know. Anyhow, all of that is sort of saying that, you know, from the CMS perspective, managing that front end experience is less valuable, managing the content is more valuable. And a lot of the systems are starting to look exactly the same. So that's the other thing that you'll see. So if you look at contentful.com, which is an online only CMS, it only does the back end. It doesn't even really have a front end that you have to supply your own front end to it. And then in the uh, sort of uh, smaller scale world, there's a craft CMS, which is a PHP based CMS that um, has a front end component, but is designed to really act as the back end component for you, like an open sourcey, well, sort of commercial source version of Contentful that you can put on whatever site you want. Um, and then there are other systems like Netlift, Netafly, and Heroku, and other things that are providing the ability for you to write the content locally and just push the content to one of their servers where they'll create the website for you just from that content, you know. And so, you know, all this kind of means that the, the, there's a lot of energy going into like specializing the delivery of content more so than the managing of content, you know, and the, the content management tools are pretty same between similar between these systems like they all have some form of taxonomy. They all have some form of fields that you can create where you can put in the author's name in one field and, you know, the date of the content in another field. And, you know, the differentiation between these is really just an elegance at this point. It's not so much in feature differentiation, you know, and I think that's going to continue. And even WordPress, which historically has been like the, you know, one of the easiest CMSs to get in, but the least feature rich is starting to add that fielded kind of stuff and kind of converge to the same place. And so in three or four years, many of these systems are going to be indistinguishable in terms of what they do to manage your content. Thank you. Uh, Deanna, some last thoughts for our audience? Yeah, I mean, I, I would plus one to everything that Nate said. And I think that, um, you know, while the, I don't think we've seen the peak of the, the end of the line for CMS, but I do think that like the other pieces of um, digital need to catch up and integrate and make sure that like, as one is growing, so are the others so that the experience doesn't, is, is not diminished from the front end and frankly, from the back end, because, um, that data that we're getting and um, what we're seeing from people's experiences should really be helping to shape programs rather than the other way around. So. Thank you. Felipe, want to close this out with some final thoughts? Okay, so it's, it, it's interesting because I've had this discussion for, for quite a few years, talking to, to the CMS vendors. Uh, when they, were, they started focusing on integrations, I, I asked the same question, is, is CMS a solved problem or not? And many of them thought that, that yes, it was a solved problem. It would solve most of the problems. It wasn't up there with what we would expect, but you know, it was, it was okay. It was time to focus on something else. And that's, it's kind of frustrating to see that, that the industry is, is itself moving. If you see content management systems, you know, they manage content, but you know, they're not dealing with content production. So now you're dealing, you're, you're offloading that, you know, all of the pre-editorial and planning and content strategy. Yeah. That's not a, an interesting uh, step. And then, you know, delivery, you're, you start offloading some of the responsibilities to other uh, platforms. So I see, I see that in, in, in implementations. It's funny because I have to convince clients that CMS should do less and not more. And I see that as a, as a key trend because for many years, 
is the, the vendors wanted to add as much capabilities as they could. And this, and this created, you know, this huge checklist of things that CMS would be evaluated against. And this also allowed CMSs to, to have some big technical debt that would need to be filled in as, as, as you move along. As you see, you know, WordPress wasn't designed to be a general purpose CMS system, but it is dominating the CMS space for many years. So I think some are catching up. Uh, in these core uh, te technical capabilities, and some that already have them are broadening into the DXP space so that they do other stuff um, under the assumption that they had already solved many of the CMS problems before. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Tiana. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, audience, for being here today. As I said, I don't know if we had all the answers, but we certainly hopefully prodded the right questions to keep you all thinking about uh, where we're going with content management systems, technology, and budgeting into 2020.